In the fantasy series Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn, the secondary antagonist of the story is the Queen Otaku. She is the leader of the Norns, the scorned enemy of the humans of the land called Austin Ard, sometimes called the White Foxes, the Norns and their cousins, the Sithi, once lay claim to the land of Austin Ard. That is, until the arrival of the First Men. With flame and iron, the humans waged war against both Sithi and Norn, driving them out of their castles, destroying their sacred witchwood trees, and slaughtering them to near extinction. The Sithi fled deep into the woods, the Norns into the mountain heights. Deep within the cold mountain of Nakiga, Queen Otaku nurses her grievances against humanity. And they are many. Humans killed her people, they killed her husband, they killed her son's wife, an act which drove him into madness. It is said Prince Druki took his own life, but some believe that humans killed him as well. The humans took her husband, her son, her sacred lands. In response, she swore revenge. As the nobles of Austin Ard waged civil war against one another, Queen Otaku has ordered her army south. They slaughter any humans they come across, men, women, and even children. The white foxes can conjure storms, they can shatter walls with but a word, and they can raise the dead. Their cold queen will have her revenge. George R. R. Martin has admitted that memory, sorrow, and thorn has inspired A Song of Ice and Fire. So is it possible that a similar figure exists within his story? If there was a knight's king, should we be on the lookout for knight's queen? Are there female others? Before we get to the theory, please do me the honor of liking the video, subscribing to the channel, and turning on notifications. And now, on with the video. 27 years and 5 books later, we still know little and less about the others, the main antagonist of the series. They have only been encountered twice, once in the prologue of book 1 and again in a Sam chapter in book 3. Their undead servants, called Whites, have appeared more often, but even those encounters are few and far between. We don't know where they come from. We don't know why they've returned after all this time. We don't know their tax policy. All we know is one method of how to kill them. It could be that the others have their own kingdoms deep in the lands of Always Winter. That they have their own civilization with male and female others and their little White Walker children. However, I disagree. I don't think the others have their own kingdom and that the series will end with Jon Snow brokering a truce between the others and humans. The others are the personification of death and you can't make a deal with death. This is not The Sims. In this series, all you can say to death is, not today, and that's not a bargain. The others don't have kingdoms, they don't create, their only purpose is to kill, and they don't have families because they can't breed. As creatures of the cold, as death personified, they can't bring new life into the world, so they have other ways of reproducing, and this is why there are no female others. The others do have a method of reproduction and it is based on cold efficiency, a system where human boys are used to make more others. Either they are sacrificed to make more white walkers or they are transformed into white walkers. I will cover this more in depth later in the video. George R. R. Martin once said, quote, fire is love, fire is passion, fire is sexual ardor and all of these things. Ice is betrayal. Ice is revenge, ice is, you know, that kind of cold inhumanity and all that stuff is being played out in the books." End quote. Martin has also said the others are living things. He said the others are, quote, strange, beautiful, think, oh, the she made of ice, something like that, a different sort of life, inhuman, elegant, dangerous, end quote. In both these quotes, he describes the theme of cold and the others as inhuman, which means we should not expect the others to operate as humans do, which means the others, as creatures of cold, are diametric to humanity, humanity being warmth, light, fire. Fire in this series is often emblematic of life. Martin said it's love, passion, sexual ardor. It's hard to imagine two creatures of the cold laying down together making love and producing life. 
an other as a mother, an other mother, it's incongruent with the themes of the story. The others don't make love. They hate. It takes a man and a woman to create new life, but it's the woman that carries the life. It's the woman that brings that new life into the world. Pregnancy, motherhood, these are all things that go with the theme of fire. To quote from the Song of the Seven, the mother gives the gift of life and watches over every wife. Her gentle smile ends all strife and she loves her little children. End quote. To become pregnant, one must have sex. And according to George R.R. R. Martin, sex and passion are thematically fire. Yes, I am fully aware there are other ways of conceiving a child outside of sex. But I'm specifically talking about this world and the themes in this story. And no, I am not saying that if women can't reproduce, then they have no place in a civilization. I am talking about evil ice elves and how they operate in this fantasy story. Don't be weird in the comments. When Daenerys Targaryen walks into her husband's funeral pyre, that is their final union. As husband and wife, Daenerys emerges from the pyre, a mother. Yes, the pyre, in a sense, is a sex scene. I explain this more in depth in my video on Danny and Drogo and their dark romance. After this final consummation, Danny becomes a mother. Then there is the scene of Jon Snow and Egret in the cave. Quote, his vows, her maidenhood, none of it mattered, only the heat of her, the mouth on his, the finger that pinched his nipple. End quote. Danny and Drogo in the pyre, Jon Snow feeling Egret's warmth, Egret, whose hair is red, which means she is kissed by fire. Both unions are layered and layered with a the theme of fire. Contrary to these two unions of warmth, there is that nightmare Daenerys has in Book 5. Quote, beneath her coverlets, she tossed and turned, dreaming that Hisdar was kissing her, but his lips were blue and bruised, and when he thrust himself inside her, his manhood was cold as ice. She sat up with her hair disheveled and the bedclothes attangled. End quote. In A Song of Ice and Fire, pleasure and pain can mix, but there is no pleasure here, only pain. The blue bruised lips, the coldness, this is ice, this is death. Motherhood, even when it's not associated with pregnancy and birth, is still thematically associated with fire. Again, using Daenerys Targaryen as an example, when she visits the House of the Undying, she is shown a vision of her becoming the mother to her people. Quote, Beneath the mother of mountains, a line of naked crones crept from a great lake and knelt shivering before her, their gray heads bowed. Ten thousand slaves lifted blood-stained hands as she raced by on her silver, riding like the wind. Mother! They cried. Mother! Mother! They were reaching for her, touching her, tugging at her cloak. The hem of her skirt, her foot, her leg, her breast. They wanted her, needed her, the fire, the life. And Danny gasped and opened her arms to give herself to them. End quote. To speak more on motherhood and fire, we must turn to Sir Davos and Melisandre. When Sir Davos smuggles Melisandre into Storm's End, Melisandre reveals a shocking secret there, within the dank, dark depths of the castle. Quote, There was no answer but a soft rustling, and then a light bloomed amidst the darkness. Davos raised a hand to shield his eyes and his breath caught in his throat. Melisande had thrown back her cowl and shrugged out of the smothering robe. Beneath, she was naked and huge with child. Swollen breasts hung heavy against her chest and her belly bulged as if near to bursting. God's preserve us, he whispered and heard her answering laugh, deep and throaty. Her eyes were hot coals and the sweat that dappled her skin seemed to glow with a light of its own. Millicent shone. Panting, she squatted and spread her legs. Blood ran down her thighs, black as ink. Her cry might have been agony or ecstasy or both. And Davis saw the crown of the child's head push its way out of her. End quote. 
It is said some people glow when pregnant. Melisandre radiated with light. I don't believe this is part of her glamour. It is a product of her magical pregnancy. There are some effects Melisandre cannot create as an illusion of her power. The pregnancy is real. The radiant light is real. The shadow is real. We know for a fact she has a body temperature higher than others. Jon Snow can feel the heat pouring off of her when they ride together in the elevator at the wall. Quote, in the close confines of the iron cage, he was acutely aware of the red woman's presence. She even smells red. The scent reminded him of Micken's forge, of the way iron smelled when red hot. The scent was smoke and blood, kissed by fire, he thought, remembering Egret. The wind got in amongst Melisandre's red robes and sent them flapping against John's legs as he stood beside her. You are not cold, my lady? He asked her. She laughed. Never. The ruby at her throat seemed to pulse in time with the beating of her heart. The Lord's fires live within me, Jon Snow. Feel. She put her hand on his cheek and held it there while he felt how warm she was. This is how life should feel, she told him. Only death is cold. End quote. The fire within Melisandre burns so hot that ice melts in her presence. She hopes Jon Snow will see this and witness the power she possesses. Quote, As they walk beneath the wall, she slipped her arm through his. Morgan and Merrill went before them. Ghost came prowling at their heels. The priestess did not speak, but she slowed her pace deliberately, and where she walked, the ice began to drip. He will not fail to notice that. End quote. This is no doubt how she entranced Stannis Baratheon by proving her power is quite real. Stannis wants power. He needs all the power he can get if he wants to win the Iron Throne. But Jon Snow does not crave power in a similar way. So Melisandre's desperate desire to gain his approval through such demonstrations is often ignored. Fire is life. Motherhood is life. To quote another Davos chapter, you are the mother of darkness. I saw that under storm's end when you gave birth before my eyes. Is the brave Sir Onions so frightened of a passing shadow? Take heart, then. Shadows only live when given birth by light. And the king's fires burn so low, I dare not draw off any more to make another son. It might well kill him. Melisande moved closer. With another man, though, a man whose flames still burn hot and high. If you truly wish to serve your king's cause, come to my chamber one night. I could give you pleasure such as you have never known. And with your life fire, I could make a horror. Davis retreated from her. I want no part of you, my lady, or your god. May the seven protect me. End quote. J. R. R. Tolkien once said, quote, Evil is not able to create anything new. It can only distort and destroy what has been invented or made by the forces of good. End quote. Is A Song of Ice and Fire strictly about the battle of good versus evil? No. Martin has criticized formulaic fantasy in many interviews and write-ups in the past, but that does not mean there aren't evil characters and entities in this series. The others are evil, or as close to evil as an entity can get in this world. They want nothing more than to eradicate all human life from Westeros and potentially the rest of the world as well. To that end, they kill any and every living thing they encounter. We cannot believe these beings that can end all life are also capable of creating life as well. Do the others bring the cold or does the cold bring the others? It almost doesn't matter. What matters is the cold and the others are both death. If there are no female others, the question we are left with is, how do the others reproduce? Beyond the wall, there was a wildling named Craster. He maintained a keep north of White Tree, a wildling village. Craster shared the keep with his many wives, as well as his many daughters. 
Some of his wives were also his daughters. The living conditions at Craster's Keep were grim, dire, and brutal. Craster abused his wives and his daughters. Many of them were raped and forced to give birth. Infant daughters were kept to be raised as new wives. Infant sons were left to suffer a different fate. Quote, My lord, John said quietly as the wood closed in around them once more. Craster has no sheep, nor any sons. Mormont made no answer. At Winterfell, one of the serving women told us stories, John went on. She used to say that there were wildlings who would lay with the others to birth human children. Hearth tales. Does Craster seem less human to you in half a hundred ways? He gives his sons to the wood. A long silence. Then, yes. And yes, the raven muttered, strutting, end quote. Craster does not just give his sons to the wood. He offers them as a sacrifice to the cold gods, the others. It is not known how long Craster has been doing this, but one can assume it's been going on for several years now, perhaps even decades. With so many women forced to give birth to his children, who knows how many of his sons are still out there? And if he's been doing it, well, he can't be the only one beyond the wall making these sacrifices. The long-standing theory is that the others take the infant boys and transform them into others. Evil cannot create anything new. It can only distort and destroy. The women at Craster's Keep didn't believe the sons were simply exposed and left for dead in the cold. It's theorized Craster was allowed to settle in his keep unharmed as long as he gave the others his sons. If he had no sons to give, he would offer animal sacrifices. If there are female others, why don't they take Craster's daughters as well? If there's a population of others out there and they can breed with one another, the more men and women there are, the faster the population can grow. But the others cannot reproduce. They cannot make life. They are creatures of cold and those are acts associated with fire. Perhaps a better title for the video should have been, Can the Others Breed? The answer would still be no. And that is why the others only want sacrifices of male infants. It reminds me of The Unsullied. The idea is to create a uniform force of fighters, nearly identical in appearance. In the prologue of A Game of Thrones, the others are described as being twins in appearance. And when Danny meets the Unsullied in Book 3, she says they are like one man, despite the Unsullied having different skin tones and heights. The Unsullied are also incapable of breeding. Their manhoods are cut off and then burned on the altar of the Lady of Spears. This associates them with fire as the others are associated with ice. And so because the others can't breed, they rely on human sacrifice. This is why Craster has so many quote-unquote wives. It's so he can produce more male children to sacrifice to the others. And the others do not bother him because they find him beneficial. But after Craster was killed by mutinous members of the Night's Watch, there is no reason for the others to allow the keep to keep standing. When you make deals with the devil like this, you're only delaying the inevitable. You're basically asking to be killed last because the others would have never spared Craster. They would have killed him if he did not get himself killed before that time came. The women of the keep knew this. They knew the sons would return and in returning, they would destroy them all. This is why Gilly begs Sam to take her even after Craster has died. She knows there is still danger. Quote, Where? Asked Sam puzzled. Where should I take her? Someplace warm, the two old women said as one. Gilly was crying. Me and the babe, please. I'll be your wife like I was Craster's. Please, Sir Crow, he's a boy, just like Nella said he'd be. If you don't take him, they will. They, said Sam, and the raven cocked its black head and echoed, They, they, they. The boy's brothers, said the old woman on the left, crashed her sons. The white coals rising out there, Crow. I can feel it in my bones. These poor old bones don't lie. They'll be here soon. The sons. End quote. 
Sam and Gilly flee with Gilly's newborn son. However, it appears they were pursued. Sometime later, while hiding in a long hall on their way back to the wall, Sam and Gilly are met with death. Quote, Then by the door, one of the shadows moved, a big one. This is still a dream, Sam prayed. Oh, make it that I'm still asleep. Make it a nightmare. He's dead. He's dead. I saw him die. He's come for the babe, Gilly wept. He smells him. A babe fresh born stinks a life. He's come for the life. End quote. Gilly is not wrong. Cold Hands confirms her theory in a Bran chapter in book five. Quote, Those wolves are close as well, Bran warned them. The ones that have been following us. Summer can smell them whenever we're downwind. Wolves are the least of our woes, said Cold Hands. We have to climb. It'll be dark soon. You would do well to be inside before night comes. Your warmth will draw them. End quote. But if there are no female others, what of Night's King and his wife, the Corpse Queen? Well, to begin, this is an ancient legend, so therefore it must needs be taken with a huge grain of salt. As I said in my theory video on Night's King, I think his story is a cautionary tale because Night's King broke every single one of his vows. He claimed a crown, took a corpse to be his queen, practiced strange sorceries, and claimed the night fort as his castle. Night's King's story is a warning. Any character that follows in his footsteps is a danger. To end where this story began, Queen Otaku and her assault on Austin Ard ultimately failed. The end of Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn saw the Norn Queen defeated. Her armies had no choice but to retreat to their mountain of Nikiga. Human armies pursued them and would have slaughtered them completely, but it was ultimately decided Norn genocide was not the answer. So deep within the heart of her mountain, Queen Otaku continues to plot revenge. Her next attack is part of the plot of the sequel series, The Last King of Austin Ard. Because her people's numbers are so low, the Norns have gone to desperate lengths to grow their population. They have begun to take human women as sex slaves. Many Norn men have multiple wives, a Norn wife and a human wife. The humans are viewed as concubines. They exist purely to give birth to half-human children that will be raised as warriors. This hellish breeding program has greatly increased the Norn population. The realm of Austin Ard is completely unaware, and now, with a great new army and a host of other magical means at her disposal, Queen Otaku has once again sent her forces south to march on Austin Ard, but this time, she marches with them. Yeah, shit's getting real this time. Last time, she stayed in her mountain and sent forth psychic attacks to help her army. This time, she's taking the field. If you're not reading the books, you need to be reading the books. Anyway, humans and Norns are able to breed with one another because Norns are not inhuman. They might live in cold and distant lands, but they don't use ice as arms and armor as the others do. There is a warmth to them. They are capable of love. They both love and hate their cousins. They both love and hate one another. They both love and hate their queen. There is love in Queen Otaku's Mountain of Nakiga. There is no love in the lands of always winter. Quote, Finally, he looked north. He saw the wall shining like blue crystal and his bastard brother, Jon Snow, alone in a cold bed, his skin growing pale and hard as memory as all warmth fled from him. And he looked past the wall, past endless forest cloaked in snow, past the frozen shore and the great blue-white rivers of ice in the dead plains where nothing grew or lived. North and north and north he looked, to the curtain of light at the end of the world, and then beyond that curtain. He looked deep into the heart of winter, and then he cried out, afraid, and the heat of his tears burned on his cheeks. Now you know, the crow whispered at his sat on his shoulders. Now you know why you must live. End quote. And that's it, why I think there are no female others. I could provide more examples to back up my theory, I could take this much, much further, but this video was written to be brief. I decided to go back to basics with this one. 
The others are creatures of the cold. They are agents of death. To think they can breed as humans do when sex and motherhood doesn't match with a the theme that passion, sex, motherhood, these are all things that are part of life. And life is fire. Thank you all for watching. I hope you all enjoyed. And if you did, it's time to call the banners. Please like, subscribe, and leave a comment down below. Tell me, do you think there are female others out there? And now I want to take this opportunity to give a shout out to another channel. Fellow YouTuber Ratat has recently released a video covering the story Meat House Man written by George R.R. Martin. I talked about this story in my video The Rise and Fall of Peter Littlefinger Baelish. However, Ratat's video is a comprehensive deep dive into the story. He picks up on things that I completely missed in my analysis. If you're into Martin's other works and you want to hear someone really get into the material, this is a video you're going to want to check out. The link to his video will be in the description down below. Consider supporting this channel and my mad rants on Patreon or becoming a channel member. Memberships go for as little as $1 a month. When I'm not making super long videos here on this channel, I am making videos on my second channel, Mad King Kevin. I moved a lot of my older unscripted content over there. So if there's a video of mine that you liked that's not on my channel anymore, check out the second one. It might be there. Thank you to the following Patreon supporters and channel members, including Philip E., Daniel, and Jessica P. Again, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.